the notes that you will get, there is actually a very detailed tutorial in which I have taken essentially one or two circuits which produce glitches. Okay? And then we just go step by step by step saying this is what the computer will do. And then it will become clear to you if you just go through that, that uh, this is how the simulation proceeds so that the concurrency and the time they become quite clear to you. All right? Now, the way the simulation proceeds is that it proceeds. So, unfortunately, we do not have time and I and I will leave you leave for you to do the tutorials on your own time. Okay? So, uh, the way the simulation proceeds is the following. The first step is the syntax checking, grammar checking. So, you have described something and just like a C compiler or anything, you, you check for the syntax that everything is according to the correct syntax. The second thing is elaboration. The circuits are described in a compact way. For example, there might have been a 1 kilobyte memory. Now, you are not going to describe every bit of the memory. right? Each is a hardware, but you will have some repeti repetition grammar saying take this 1 bit memory and expand it 10,000 times or whatever. But when you do the simulation, each bit is different and must be separately simulated. right? So, therefore, the circuit has to be elaborated, has to be expanded out to its actual value. You might have described a circuit behaviorally. For example, you might have said that a counter is a d flip flop with q bar returned to d okay? and then you may have 4 of them. Now, each one receives a different signal. You have described the behavior of the counter only once that these are the properties of, of a d flip flop. But because of this interconnection, each one of those d flip flop has a different behavior depending on, on what it is connected. So, while the description has it only once, in reality it has to be repeated 4 times and such expanding out is done at the time of elaboration. Okay? However, at the time of elaboration, a very important data structure is developed. This data structure is called the sensitivity data structure. That means, any piece of hardware is sensitive to some inputs. That means, its output has to be recalculated when that input changes. Okay? Now, in general combinational logic, the output is sensitive to all its inputs. But that is not always so. Indeed, you are all familiar with transparent latches. Okay? A transparent latch is such, this is a transparent latch. It looks just like a D flip flop. But its property is that when clock is high, Q is equal to D. If D changes, Q will change. Okay? That means, it is transparent. So, any change in D will be reflected in a change in Q. This is a transparent latch. A flip flop on the other hand is exactly the same except that if the clock is 0 or 1, Q remains fixed. It does not change when D changes. Okay? Only when Q ha clock has a transition then the value of d is red and assigned to q right that's the standard flip flop the transparent latch latch simply says that when the clock is high q is a copy of d when the clock is low the q retains its old value right now both of them look very similar how will you describe them differently in a hardware description language the behavioral description seems to be that when the clock goes to 1 then q equal to d What is the difference between the latch and the flip flop then? One is? No, no, but in this description. See, the value is assigned only once and it is assigned when the q goes from 0 to 1. Right? Correct. 
You will not change. We can change. Right. So the only difference between them, their behavior is the same. Their sensitivities are different. The latch is sensitive to clock as well as D. If either changes, the output has to be recomputed. Whereas the flip flop is sensitive only to clock. If D changes, Q need not be recomputed. Only when the clock has a positive transition, a new value of Q has to be computed. This is the only difference between these two. Right? So, therefore, a circuit need not be sensitive to all its inputs. So, when we describe a circuit, the sensitivities are inferred and these sensitivities are then made into a data structure and then you say that if there is a signal, you make a list of all the circuits who are sensitive to you. Now, should the value of this signal change, you wake up all the uh, pieces of hardware who are sensitive to this signal. right? So, essentially it is a reverse mapping. When you describe some hardware, you say this hardware is sensitive to this signal. So, then you put hardware U1 sensitive to this, U2 sensitive to this, U3 sensitive to this. Now, you do a reverse sorting of this. You say this signal and U1, U13 and U15 are sensitive to it. Signal B, U4 and U10 are sensitive to it. Okay? So, you do a reverse sorting and this is done at the time of elaboration. Once this is done, then the third step is simulation. And in the simulation, you have a loop. There is first step which is called signal update. That means, all those transactions that at this time make this signal equal to this. So, at the current time, if the time of some waiting is up, then you update that signal at this time. So, first you do signal update. You do not compute the effect of the signal update. Simply update all the signals which are waiting to be updated. Okay? So, all signals are updated first. Then evaluate which signal changed. and that is called an event. Because of this update, it might be possible that a signal was updated, but it did not change at all. Okay? For example, you might say make Q equal to 0 at 30 microseconds. When the time became 30 microseconds, you assigned 0 to Q, but it turns out that the old value of Q was also 0. In that case, no change has occurred, but if the old value of Q was different, then you will say that Q has had an event. So, all updates will not result in events. Only when a value changes, it will result in an event. Okay? So, you check whether an event has occurred. First, do the updating of all and keep track of which signals have had an event. And the next is called selected or selective simulation. And what you do is a nested loop for each event, for each component sensitive to this event. We simulate the circuit. So, more than one event may have occurred. So, you take an event, then you go to your data structure, who cares about this event? So, you will say circuit A and circuit B care about this, this signal. So, then you wake up A and say look, this nodes just now became 1, what do you think of your output? So, that guy says what is the current time? So, you say current time is 30 microseconds. So, that guy will say please make my output equal to this at 30 microseconds plus delta. You wake up the second circuit and then that guy will say, oh, this signal changed. What is the current time? So, you say current time is 30 microseconds. So, he says make my output equal to this at 31 microseconds. 
okay each resimulation will then result in a set of transactions no output will be made at that time these transactions will be entered into a time ordered queue okay so you retain a time ordered queue in which there is a request that at this time please do this at this time please do this at this time please do this this is ordered according to time okay you finish insert so these these uh, when you do resimulation the output will be recomputed and that output will not be updated immediately that output will be inserted in this according to the time at different places in this queue and when you have done that all then you will see what is the top entry in this and then at once a time variable to that and now again do this whole thing re repeatedly till all events have been taken care of so this is how simulation actually proceeds okay i have very little time and madam date is going to kill me because this is not the part that you are going to use okay this is something which has to be always at the back of your head when you use simulation okay however now let's look at a particular kind of uh, kind of description which has only structural description there is no behavioral description in that okay so in structural description what do we do i'm taking vhdl as an example now because now we are doing practical things each component is described as a two part object the first part is the is the external look so you look at each object from outside and from inside okay so when you look at it from outside what do you see you see its spin diagram and you know what circuits to connect to its spin okay that is called an entity okay so to take an example let's say entity d flip flop so i'll say entity dff is and then i must specify its port okay so i will say port and then i'll have a comma separated list of all the inputs all the outputs and their bit types okay so for example i will say port d and clock followed by a colon and there are two properties which are to be specified what kind of signal and what is its direction okay so for i will say for example d and clock are inputs and they are of the type bit okay and this whole construct can be repeated in a list separated by semicolons okay so for example i might say semicolon and then q q bar are out and bit okay this describes the ports of this notice that i could have also said d in bit clock in bit and so on okay i need not group all all signals of the same direction i can describe them individually or as a group if i describe them as a group of signals then they will must be comma separated and this entire construct is separated by semicolons and the list and its properties are separated by colon the whole thing is inside brackets and this whole thing ends with a semicolon okay so you have described its spin diagram in short and then you say end entity df now in the old vhdl there was a whole lot of uh, dancing that you had to do uh, you had to convert this entity into a component 
and then you had to instantiate that component in order to use it in a circuit. Modern VHDL allows you to instantiate D flip flops directly or any any entities directly. Okay? So, maybe I do not I am not sure, but in your lab perhaps you will use that side. Okay. So, now the entity is over, you must describe the look from inside. So, when you look at a component from inside, you are describing how does it work. Okay? So, you say architecture give this arch architecture some name. Okay? So, say my first, you could give any name. Now, you have to specify an architecture of which entity you are specifying. Okay? So, you say architecture my first of DFF is. Okay? And now, you can specify between begin and end the working of this part. Now, this part can be either behavioral or it could be structural. Okay? So, if it is structural, then you will instantiate components. So, you might say to give you an example, u 1 Okay, so, u 1 is a component name. Now, you have to say what kind of component it is. Okay? So, modern this thing can instantiate either components or entities. The old one never allowed you to uh, instantiate entities. So, in this one, if you are using entity, then you might say entity. This is by the way optional. D f f and then you say port map. Port map is equivalent to soldering a wire. Okay? So, the entity told you what is its pin diagram. So, it has a pin called D, a pin called clock and so on. Now, you are connecting these pins to some signal, okay? which is equivalent to soldering a wire. So, you are soldering a particular wire to the D pin, soldering a particular wire to the clock pin and so on. That is called port map. So, you are simply saying port map and maybe your circuit may have some uh, interconnections. Let us take some example that this is D clock Q Q bar and let us say we are we have a divide by 2. So, we take connect Q bar to D okay? and then you might have some other signals and then this might be your output and the clock could be generated from let us say an AND of enable an external clock. Okay? So, now I will have this entity called a circuit, big circuit. It is a it is enable ex, external clock and D will be its port signal like before and this called call it X or something will be its output. And now, you will instantiate this AND gate and you will have to use this as some internal signal called A. right? So, you will have to declare in this begin and end. So, for example, you will say entity big circuit is port D clock enable in bit and you might directly say Q out bit. Okay, end entity big circuit. So you declared the now bigger circuit using that smaller piece. Okay, assume that just like D flip flop, you have described the end gate also. All right. So then what you will say is architecture. some name of big circuit is and then begin.
Now, first of all, you must declare all the local variables. So, A is a local variable that is not known from the port, okay, and that is the only circuit in this particular one which is local, all right. So, then you will say A, notice that internal signals there is no direction, do not have to give them as in or out. So, you say A is a signal of type bit, okay. So, after begin, you will say signal A bit. Huh? The uh, Q bar was part of this, it is a port signal. So, yeah, yeah, internally, of course, if you are taking it, I am assuming that Q and Q bar are going output. So, then in that case, you should give Q bar here. We are not doing, doing any processing on Q bar. Right. Oh, you are connecting it to D. Yeah. All right. And then you assign this signal A, and let's say that this is called B. Then you must instantiate the AND gate. So you say U1 is of type AND. Okay. The modern version of uh, VHDL will require you to declare that you are directly instantiating an entity. So you will say AND u1 entity and okay and then port map and now you map the signals of this to this so you'll say port map enable external clock and a okay then you will port port map this so in wherever the clock occurred you will put a Okay, and you will port mac q bar to b as well as d to b, which will short q bar to q bar to d. All right, and then take the output. So, in short, every internal wire will carry a signal. You must declare the signal and the type. You could, it could be a bus, it could be an 8 bit bus, right. So, in that case, you will declare it as an array, but otherwise, signal there are some IEEE type signals, etcetera do not have time to uh, go through that, but the structural descriptions essentially involve the following. You first must have in your library all the entities that you are using. Okay? So, the either you must have described it or it must come from a separate library. So, you must have all the entities that you have and then you must declare an architecture, declare all the signal. So, here for example, A and B will have to be declared of type B. Okay, so signal A and B will have to be declared as. No, no, no. It is inside the architecture. Which one? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. All the declarations come before begin. Okay, and then uh, you instantiate all the components and then end. Okay. This is a purely structural description. It simply says what is connected to what and how, using what. But you might actually have mixed. For example, you might say this is the interconnect and then this signal, you might have some signal here which, which you would say D is equal to A or X depending on some C. Okay? So, you say if C equal to 1 then d equal to x else d equal to a okay so that is behavioral the rest is structural so you can mix both kinds and then apply an input to this whole thing and test it out okay now one last point before my time runs out is that de design description is not everything you have to then test this circuit that it is working like you do so that is called a test bench so you have a test bench in which the circuit you just designed, the whole circuit that you designed is one component and this describes how you will test it. Okay? So, you will apply some inputs to it using sources and you will observe some outputs and compare them to some standard output and generally produce 
a result, okay, either an error if it does not agree, etcetera, etcetera. Right? So, for example, if the timing is wrong, then you say over this period the two did not agree. This whole circuit is called a test bench. What is the remarkable thing about a test bench? It is also another circuit after all. So, why should we worry about test bench as a separate kind of thing? It just uses the circuit that you designed as a component and applies all sorts of test circuits to it, test signals to it and looks at, looks at its output and behaviorally sees if the outputs are equal to expected values or not. right? But there is one remarkable property of this uh, test bench. Uh, no, that is the function of it, but there is a particular remarkable property of a test bench. No, it has an entity. No, no, port map you will require, you, you are placing all these components, so port map you will require, correct. Its port list is empty. That means, anything that you want is part of this big circuit. There are no, essentially this bench has the circuit that I have designed and all the test devices and nothing is coming out of this bench. Anything that I want for testing it is all already inside. There are no external input or output to this circuit. Okay? So, that is the mark of a test bench. It has an empty port list. Okay? So, you will have entity test bench is port just closed without anything okay? and end entity test bench. So, a test bench is something which is self sufficient. It has the circuit that you want to test and let us say that we have just designed an HDT file. So, the first description is completely behavioral, right? specifications have been given to us. So, it is a completely behavioral and I have a test bench which generates various instructions according to the timing of its bus and it gives various instructions and some test program needs to run on this ATT file. Right? So, it is a complicated test bench and this test bench will then run through, but the, anything that I need for testing this ATT file is part of this circuit. Okay, and including applying inputs and testing outputs. Therefore, this test bench is self sufficient and its port will be 0. Next, when I go from fully behavioral to let us say now first block level decomposition. Now, all I can do is just plug out the old architecture and put in the new architecture and even this new architecture should have exactly the same output. If it does not, that means, I have fouled up somewhere and I can catch myself right at that point. If that works, then I take out the ALU and replace the ALU by gate. Again, plug in the whole thing. Again, it should give me the same result and so on. This way, I catch my errors as soon as they occur and do not let them propagate a long way. So, therefore, a test bench is a very useful uh, circuit and almost any circuit that you design must be designed with a test bench to ensure that it is indeed, its, its behavior is indeed what was specified to be the behavior. I think that is all the, the time that we have for right now. Uh, Madam, you will require only structural description from them. No, no. So, all I have done is what is under the bonnet of a simulator, the idea of delta times and so on, but also entity architecture and so on and behavior in, instantiation of components. So, that I have done, but I have not done any processes and if then else and case and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, the rest, the, uh, the instantiation of components and declaration of signals I have done, but uh, we have not had time to do behavior. Yeah, yeah. Sir, just one question. Why we are not able to simulate transistor level circuits and synthesize them using VHDL? Not VSDL is not capable of simulating and synthesizing transistor level circuits. No, that is because the model it, it that is not actually correct. The point is what is the library that you are using. Okay? So, in case of VHDL, the uh, model for a transistor it is it is considered useless to go down to a transistor level. It is assumed that your library will always have digital circuits and which will then go down. However, this is wrong to say that you, you cannot synthesize transistor level. If you have models 
for a transistor as a switch, then you can synthesize down to a transistor. The only point is that unlike Verilog, the uh, model for the transistor is not a part of the language, it is part of a library. So, if you have a library which describes the transistor, there is no problem. But in Verilog also we are able to simulate, not synthesize. No, of course, you, simul you, you, no, you synthesize. synthesize Synthesizer is not part of the language, but in a Verilog system of course, meaning maybe you should show, sh should be shown, we must show it to you then, uh, synthesis. There is no difference, Verilog and VHDL are only syntactically but different. Synthesis means can it be downloaded to FPGA? It sure, using Verilog, of tra course. Transistor level design. Of course. There is no difference between VHDL, these are two different, it is like two programming languages, Fortran and C. So, both can be used for, uh, uh, for both. No, but the transistor level in one case is part of the language, that is what I am saying. So, NMOS is a, is a component understood by the language. In the other case, there is no inbuilt component. Any component that you use has to come from a library and if you have a library then VHDL will also do. But so, books are saying that uh, FPGA programming for transistor level is not possible. This has nothing to do with programming language, which so FPGA gives you a transistor? Suppose sir, I am designing a transistor level, uh, suppose I am designing a NAND no, no. gate. Using so, are level. we talking of FPGA or are we talking of ASIC? No sir, F, I am designing a uh, circuit, end gate circuit for simulation purpose and I use very log for design. Yeah. Simulation part is uh, it is quite easy and it can be done. Now, second part is uh, am I able to synthesize it and download to the FPGA? No, the Books. Again, we are back to FPGA. If you are using FPGA, then you can use VHDL, Verilog, X system, Verilog, whatever you want. A transistor is not available to you. In an FPGA, you have only L LUTs and so yes, on, those yes. components available, the transistor is not visible to you. So, it is not a function of the programming language, it is a function of the architecture of the FPGA that a transistor is not available. So, if a language was did allow you to allow you to, uh, to synthesize right down to the transistor level, it will do you no good at all, because you cannot address a single transistor in an FPGA. You cannot use a transistor in an FPGA. Suppose you wanted a single transistor. You cannot get that transistor in an FPGA. But presently we have those uh, mixed type uh, FPGAs or FPAA, field programmable analog arrays, which include transistors also. So Correct. So that is that. So that is not an FPGA. So no. The C of gate, the C of gate design. Sure, but then the you can you can use that using both VHDL and Verilog. So now if we should be able to simulate uh, synthesize transistors there. You will if if you have if you have a library which does that, then there is no problem. Okay. In general, synthesizing down to transistors is no use, because nobody has that kind of design time in which you will synthesize down to this thing. In fact, the effort is going towards other modern design for example, even counters. In fact, some designs use microprocessors as a black box. The modern FPGAs for example, come with for example, the Xilinx series comes with four FPGAs as components. So, the idea is that you stop designing as soon as you hit a component which is available in your library. You never ever have to go down to a single transistor level. But it is not a property of the, it is not a property of the language, it is a, it is a property of the design style. Okay. The way language Verilog is very MOS specific. So, many MOS structures become part of the language itself. VHDL is a generic language and any technology that you wish must be brought in. As, uh, as, as, a, as a library of components. So, for example, VHDL even refuses to look as a bit collection and will not convert it to an integer. It does not know which bit is most significant. It refuses to assign a most significant bit and least significant sense to a collection of bits. To it a collection of bits is a collection of bits. Verilog makes many more assumptions. So, for example, it makes the assumption that the leftmost leftmost uh, bit is in fact the most significant bit. It allows you to assign from a assign uh, from different width buses one to the other and so on. So, essentially Verilog is a very loose language 
therefore it is a very convenient language, you have to do very little. On the other hand, your chances of making mistakes are very high. VHDL is a very formal language, you have to do a lot of work, but on the other hand you are sure, that is the difference. But otherwise at heart both are simulation languages which follow the thing that I described right in the beginning. When we write a VHDL code after functional simulation, we are going for the timing simulation. So whatever the delay introduced in the timing simulation, what kind of delay it is? That, that, come, no, that, that is generally inertial and that comes from the library of parts. So essentially what happens is, first you want to see that the circuit that you are proposing works properly. At that time you do not want to bother about delay. So that is the zero delay model and then you will have the timing delay. So there are various delay models. Then there is the constant gate delay model in which you assume that every gate has the same delay, but it is not zero because there are some things which might be missed out if every everybody has zero delay. Okay? For example, all glitches will vanish because they will have zero width. So next you might want to do constant gate delay model in which every delay has a fixed gate, one gate delay or two gate delays. So all delays are measured in integer multiples of a gate delay. And then you have the timing model in which what happens is that suppose you are using a Xilinx FPGA. It actually computes the delay of that component based on where it is laid out, how, how long a wire has been used and so on. And there is an idea of back plugging of those values. So what happens is that you describe the circuit and then the timing delay simulator adds an after clause with the actual delay extracted from the circuit depending on the actual layout. And now the, the uh, simulation that you get is, is exact according to the time. And then there is a pre layout and post layout timing simulation. So in the pre layout timing simulation, the wiring delays are not taken into account. In the post layout, not only are the component delays taken into account, but the wiring because now you know the wire length. So the wiring delays are also taken into account. So is it possible to minimize that uh, delay that we are getting in the timing simulation? You can, there are various, various synthesis switches that you have. There are switches which will minimize complexity. There are switches which will minimize delay. So you have to trade off one against the other. For example, suppose you want to minimize the time, then it might allocate close by gates and certain gates may become unreach unreachable because of that. So you may waste a lot of hardware resource, but you will get a very fast circuit. On the other hand, you may want to minimize complexity. In that case, it will use every resource even though it has to use a tortuous wiring to reach that gate so that all your complexity is minimized. And in that case, you will get a very large circuit, but it will be slow. So these things are there given as switches at the time of synthesis. So if we can have the same program uh, in both languages, we have that. Yeah, yeah. So we have we have we have both simulators. We are if you are interested in a comparison, you can do that. Yeah. But which is actually essentially just a small component and that is why I did only the structural part. Yeah.